I highly, 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 highly suggest before you watch this episode or listen to this episode, you go check out 141 at the least. So you have somewhat of a basic understanding because we're going to move beyond episode 141, having already falsified much of virology. We are going to give some deeper context into some of the history of virology, the history of germ theory, but then go into things like pleomorphism, um, falsifying specific so-called viral illnesses like chicken pox and things like this, discussing uh, the role of bacteria, fungi, and mold, um, a number of things like that, and then also going into Lyme disease because I know you get tons of questions on that. Um, all right, so before we begin the conversation, though, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, man, what's up, guys? <laughs> My name is... Jacob Diaz. Um, I am a naturopathic practitioner, which is wild to say, because that's not where I was going to be headed six years ago. Um, I run the Instagram Undercover Virologist, where I focus specifically on infectious diseases and the history of germ theory and helping people learn about terrain, which is the philosophy that all natural medicine is based off of for thousands of years. Um, I try to make it easy, consolidate it in a way that people can understand it and apply it in their lives. And we talked about it before, how we didn't have to unlearn anything. So we kind of just understood it quickly. And we're able to explain this stuff very simply for people. Totally. And it can, it can get a uh, little bit hard to understand at times reading virology studies. And it, it's intimidating. But we do that work and then we make it easy to understand. And I've had the privilege to learn under you, uh, Mike Stone, the Baileys, Cowan, Kaufman, all these people for years. And now it's time for me to give it back to other people. So that's what I'm doing now. Appreciate that, bro. Uh, I will say that. It's now flipped and I'm asking you questions because <laughs> yeah. you've gotten far beyond me. I do remember a while back, like three, four years ago, you were the one hitting me up, asking me questions and I was explaining things to you. But now, dude, you've really taken your knowledge to another level on this topic. And that's why I'm so stoked for this conversation and bring up the point of credentials. I completely agree with you that because we didn't have any formal medical training, at least um, with, you know, you've had now health training, you could yeah. say becoming a nat naturopath naturopathic practitioner, but you did so having already understood the problems with the whole germ paradigm, because the reality is, and I've said this before in a number of episodes, that even the so-called alternative forms of medicine, holistic forms, when it comes to the various credentials that you can get, are also coming from a severely flawed premise overwhelmingly. Yeah. And that's just the reality now. I would even say almost exclusively, like when it comes to the traditional schooling, especially I know this is not your case, but if you're going to like a naturopathic medical school to become a naturopathic medical doctor, like you are going to learn a severely flawed, watered down version of how the human body works. And that's not just me saying that. I know a number of naturopathic doctors who have come to the same perspective as you and I yeah. and Cowan and others. And they're like, yeah, even what we learn in these more, quote, holistic, natural forms of, you know, medicine and, and paradigms is completely flawed. So <clears throat> it really is cool that you and I are coming in as laymen, not really understanding this stuff. For me, having my own unique health experience, for you beginning to wake up, I think, before COVID? Yeah, I mean, I I knew about, you know, 9-11 and stuff like that yeah. back then. But for health specifically, it started 2018, 2019. Okay, so That's it was before. It yeah, was before, a little bit though. before. Okay. Yeah. But then coming across the terrain perspective roughly around the same time as me or yeah, just afterwards. Right. And, okay, so we're going we're gonna to jump right into everything now yeah. because... Um, I would go more into your background, but this conversation is going to be <laughs> long, forever, yeah. dude. So. But it's going to be enjoyable for right. people. It's going to be very yeah. good. Um, it's going to answer a lot of burning questions that people oh, yeah. have with respect to various, you know, questions that are justifiable as they're resolving their cognitive dissonance surrounding the accepted infectious disease mm -hmm. model, the whole germ paradigm, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you want to learn more about Jacob, I'll of course link all of his info in the show notes and please go check out his Instagram and everything else. He really is a tremendous wealth of knowledge. Okay. So let's, let's jump right into the history of germ theory. All right, let's do that. So, uh, basically what we're taught in school and the medical paradigm is that germ theory, which is funny, they still call it a theory. They don't say germ fact, which is interesting. Um, that pastor and guys like Robert Koch were the guys that proved that germs cause disease. And when you look at their studies, they did anything of the sort. Um, and good uh, shout out to Virology, Mike Stone. He made fantastic articles that I was reading at the very beginning of this stuff, of the history of germ theory. And I did make posts about it on IG, so people want to check my sources, go, go ahead. 
But essentially, to make it really short and sweet, uh, Louis Pasteur was a chemist. Um, he did these experiments with mold and sugars called beacon experiments where he would prevent uh, air, or rather he would, he would uh, expose air to mold and uh, have sugars basically ferment. And his postulate was that air has microbes that cause fermentation. Therefore, germs cause disease, mm. which is funny because like no one and I'm drinking kombucha right now. This is a fermentative tea. No one says fermentation equals disease. Mm. But to his mind, fermentation of sugar meant disease. Therefore, germs in the air are causing disease. And he didn't check his experiments. He didn't do adequate control experiments. He actually copied those experiments from a guy named Antoine Bichamp, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and he obviously didn't give him credit at all. Bichamp actually challenged him and he ignored him. But those types of experiments that were completely uncontrolled, that were rife with a bunch of unscientific pseudoscience, which he would use albumin substances and blood and stuff that contained stuff that obviously had germs in them. But he would say, oh, the germs came spontaneously from the air. No, they're coming from within. And Bichamp did very similar experiments. As I said, he would expose stuff to air and they would ferment. But he, Bichamp, was a good scientist. He did controls and he saw that I didn't need air for fermentation. It actually came from within. But Pasteur got all the credit. And Pasteur eventually did other experiments, <clears throat> specifically with rabies, which he's, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But obviously taking unpurified samples from dogs, injected them directly into dogs and claiming effects, even though the actual articles and studies from that time say he never isolated a virus from rabies. And he did stuff with foul cholera, where he was injecting hardened fibrin in chickens and they would clot and die. And he would claim there was a, uh, a bacteria there. Uh, Robert Koch did his work with tuberculosis. Same stuff. Tuberculosis was a big issue back then. Uh, people were living in high pollution, not eating good food. So they were getting sick. And he would inject, you know, <laughs> huge cultures of tuberculosis into animals and people. And a lot of times they wouldn't even get sick. But sometimes they would. And, he, and the times that they were successful, oh, yeah, this means it's a pathogen. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to find these germs in healthy people at all times and take isolated germs and inject them and not even get any effect... Therefore, they cannot be pathogens. Right. And, so what we're talking ahead. about here is uh, so-called disease-causing bacteria, yes. right? And that's that's that goes back to the point that is even um, pretty popular nowadays amongst the natural holistic health community that you have, quote, good bacteria and bad bacteria. But that's an entirely unproven idea that there is such thing as good versus bad bacteria. It's now understanding that bacteria are there to do a very specific role and they are not the causative agent of disease. So what you're talking about is they took um, purified forms of bacteria. We know bacteria are real because we yeah. can actually like purify That's one them. thing I want to say to people. Yeah. They go on under your comments, my comments. Oh, so you're saying bacteria aren't real? I know. No, no one says no one bacteria says and fungus aren't real. They're, I, we know they're, yeah. because we see them, we can isolate them, we can ma manipulate them, we can yeah. grow them. You can't do that with a virus. Right. We'll talk about it in a bit. But those are real. Yep. We know they're real. We, they're in us. They keep us alive. Yeah, really important point because yeah. I do get comments like that all the time, and I know you do as well. Yeah. Um, but taking these so-called infectious pathogenic forms of bacteria, isolating them, and then injecting them into a healthy host wherein they don't cause illness, and even if they do cause illness in some of the cases, exactly. is injecting something exactly. the same as the... Uh, premise of the germ paradigm that there's these microbes floating about that are transmitted from sick people to healthy people causing disease in said healthy people. And I think it's pretty obvious at this point, I've talked at length on this on other episodes as well, that injecting something is in no way the same as inhaling or ingesting something Absolutely. as it is. And again, you go back to any of these studies, they virtually all of them that were done in a more, quote, natural way, no contagion was found, as I discussed None. on episode 85 of my podcast with Daniel Reutis. But sorry, I just wanted to throw that in there no. as context. Yeah, so no, you're good. That, that's that's one of the arguments with uh, the aluminum adjuvants and mercury adjuvants is, oh, you're exposed to that daily. You eat them. Yeah, but eating something and injecting something is completely different to the body. And, you know, they you read these studies, which is the foundation of germ theory. Yep. And again, people in our comments that hate us, that say we're stupid or whatever, they didn't read these studies like we did. What they did was take ridiculously large amounts of disease filtrates from, you know, like tuberculous matter, for instance, Robert Koch. He took, I think one of the words was crusty pustules or something like that. It was gross. 
And he was injecting that into rabbits' eyes and their lungs. And yeah, they would get sick, but that's not proving contagion. That no. proves that you're taking disease matter and injecting it in a way that's going to cause disease. And what's interesting about injection is things like uh, rabies and things like tuberculosis. And I think the other one was anthrax, where they would take substances that were not from diseases. So like wood, glass, stuff like that, sand, and they would be able to cause disease with that those things that didn't have any of those germs. So you can get rabies by injecting something that doesn't have rabies in it. Right. And they they publish this stuff. So it, is it the virus or the germ or is it the method of injection that leads to the disease process? Because as you said, a lot of these failed contagious studies that a lot of people know about now, they did adequate controls and stuff where they would you know cough on each other. That's natural. You know, shaking hands or spoon feeding some bacteria, even that's somewhat natural because we're exchanging bacteria all the time. Mm. And really, nobody got sick. Mm. The rest of this episode was too controversial for YouTube. So if you'd like to finish it, head to the show notes where you'll find links to watch it on our website, watch it on Rumble, or to finish it on audio platforms like Spotify or Apple. You'll also find a link to sign up for our new community platform so you can connect with your like-minded community near you. As I've said before, in-person community is absolutely essential at this point in history, and we're helping you to connect with your in-person community through our new platform on the WayForward website. So just head to the show notes for that as well.